Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Nick Lugo Show. Today, I have on an incredible guest. His name is Joseph Farley, Dr. Joseph Farley, and he is a professor on the neurobiology of psychedelics at Indiana University. He's also the professor of neurobiology of addiction at Indiana University, and he is able to tell us really what psychedelics are about, what addiction is about, and how really the two come together. And there's a lot of promise on how psychedelics can maybe cure addiction. A lot of what he's going to say is going to give you the basis of how psychedelics work in the brain. And it is such a fairly, fairly interesting discussion. I just had it and I am blown away. So I hope you enjoy. Where are you coming from in terms of your interest in this and uh, what you hope to uh, what you hope to do? So I have I have a bunch of well a, a wide range of interests to be honest with you. One of the big it, it probably yeah there's about three ranges in which you can look at it. One of them is the mystical, right? In terms of a psychedelics, just in terms of understanding the human mind and trying to understand why psychedelics actually work and how it connects to religious experience. How uh, I think there was a study where one third of people who took psychedelics in a research trial had their had called it a life changing moment, like. Like how, how does that actually have an effect? And then also I'm interested in the topic of addiction, right? And addiction, how it um, pervades in our daily lives. So for example, like I wrote this book last year, I actually had it published. It's called break your bad habits in 150 pages, a hero's journey. And nice. I wrote it. Yeah. With the purpose of hopefully being able to help my friends, my family, all these things help with sort of, I wasn't able to call them addictions because it, it, the word addiction is kind of taboo in our society, but things like overeating, things like, um, things like sex, things bad like, habit. yeah, exactly. Bad habits. <laughs> exactly. So I just stuck to calling them bad habits. And I said, you know, I essentially treated it like an addiction like I, I called it bad habits, but I treated it like an addiction. I researched all the neuropsychology, the neurobiology of addiction and, um, and try to understand really, you know, what is it that makes us tick? Where do we lose control? You know, um, and how do we stop these, these habits from forming and hopefully how do we break them? So, uh, so I'm very, very interested in that topic. And the other one I was really interested in is how it affects sort of daily productivity. You know, the, the real reason why I actually got into all of these, um, the essentially neurobiology and neuropsychology in general is just because I realized when I was 16 years old that my work habits were terrible. They were awful. I would spend three hours a day on Instagram. Right. Hey, you're a typical, you were a typical teenager. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. And I realized how influenced I was by my environment. Like, you know, if, if somebody put food in front of my face, I would eat the food. If somebody put, uh, a DS, you know, or a video game in front of my face, I would play it. If somebody put a phone in front of my face, I'd do it. And I was like, you know, what is it, what is it that made me choose that over, for example, doing homework? And it, it took me, so starting at 16, I kind of woke up to that and I've been sort of a productivity, like, I guess geek is the right word ever since because. Oh, very interesting. Very. So your major is you're a your, uh, psychology or a neuroscience major or something, but are you also a business uh, business major or something? Or, yes. Uh, so, yeah. so, so I mean, usually the extreme focus on productivity uh, identifies somebody as a business major. <laughs> Wait, really? Did you did you guess at that? Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. Really? Yeah, it's, wow. it's, it, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, you know, a lot of a lot, a lot of business majors, uh, at least when they're in college. Um, you know, turn out to be kind of type A type personalities. Yeah. I mean, they're really focused on getting things done, getting the deliverables out, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. yeah well, that's the thing. So I, um, I started in Kelly, right. I started, I was a direct admit to the wow. school of business. And then I realized that, I don't really like business as much as I thought I did, to be honest with you. Like, it's not, it's yeah. not something that, that, I realized that business is very money driven. It's like, all right, there's no purpose involved. There's no meaning involved. It's like, all right, how many dollars can I churn out today? And that's, that's really all it is. So I found myself. Well, you could, you could be a socially conscious entrepreneur. Uh, now yeah. I don't know if that's one of Kelly's strength, but <laughs> certainly that is, that is a, uh, that is, a, you know, a, a legitimate sub area within the field of business. And a lot of people are kind of, especially people of, of about your age and generation are, are really, I think, trying to uh, craft, um, you know, that kind of career path. For themselves. Yeah. 
Well, that's one of that's one of the routes that I'm really thinking about taking. I find myself right now. So at the moment, I'm a major in business. I'm not sure exactly where in business, and I'm also a major in psychology. So I'm saying there are so many different and I'm BS too. So I'm like there are so many different tracks that I could take. I could go the graduate school route. I could go the research route. I you know if I want to be a professor, which I'm really considering, I want to uh, get a PhD, or also I could become a social entrepreneur in terms of spreading psychological spreading psychological language or integrating psychology logical language into some into some helpful products oh, well sounds like uh you've given it quite a bit of thought i think you have uh, a couple of uh genuinely uh oh what's the best way of saying it? uh potentially satisfying and life affirming alternatives there to choose from yeah. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that really killed me and it was why I wrote this book in the first place, right. It was just because like you sit around and I'm sure you saw this when you were in college and I'm sure you see this in college students all the time where people will literally give up their life for something that is meaningless, right. That makes no logical sense. Like, like really, are you going to give up your whole life or going to give up your whole future for, I don't know, gambling, right. Or, or scrolling on Instagram. And you're like, how, like, you know, and you're going to spend three hours a day doing that. And it's going to ruin the entire day. And you ask the question, how exactly does that happen? And it's just. Well, we, you know, at least for classic drugs of abuse, right? I mean, the main ones, nicotine, alcohol, ethanol, et cetera, cannabis. um, And of course, uh, much harder drugs like the stimulants, cocaine, methamphetamine, opiates, etc. Yep. We, we have a pretty good scientific understanding of, you know, the, the different phases of the addiction cycle. What gets it going in the first place? What's critical in terms of transition to compulsive use, out of control use, uh, use without regard to uh, potentially aversive consequences that may cost you your relationship with family and friends and land you in jail eventually, et cetera, et cetera. So we're beginning to understand exactly uh, what's happening uh, during those classic substance addiction. Uh, the assumption is that a lot of the same mechanisms, uh, but probably not quite as supercharged, are mm-hmm. also at work in what people typically refer to as process addiction. So Playing video games, checking social media uh, repetitively and compulsively, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm sure that there's at least some overlap in terms of areas of the brain that are involved, et cetera. And apropos one of your comments about how come, uh, you know, you don't, even though you may be cognitively aware that you're wasting your time and that you're investing all of this time, energy, money, and resources and pursuit of things that ultimately really are not going to be very satisfying and in fact may be quite bad for you. Um, You're sort of unable, or we are unable to uh, stop doing it anyways. Um, We actually have a pretty good understanding, I think, of why that's the case too. Mm -hmm. Um, So my interest in psychedelics really comes out of the whole addiction area primarily. Mm -hmm. So oh. I was really struck a couple of years ago by the report. So we do, in my lab, one of the major topics that we work on is mechanisms of nicotine addiction, right? Mm-hmm. Because nicotine addiction, smoking uh, as the primary example, is by far and away the uh, most prevalent addiction worldwide. It's, uh, it's decreased a little bit in the United States over the last decade or so, primarily because of the success of the public health service announcements, you know, et cetera. But it's still way too high. And really, in terms of, you know, the single best thing that you can do to, uh, uh, you know, modify your health for the, uh, um, for the future is if you are a smoker, stop smoking. And that remains the case. By far and away, uh, much more costly and life endangering than even opiates. Problem is, opiates kill you right away. Smoking takes 20 or 30 years to kill. <laughs> um, and so anyway, I've uh, really been interested in nicotine addiction. I work with a group at Duke uh, Center for Smoking Cessation, 
Mm. My own interests are really molecular and focused on receptors and intracellular signaling, et cetera. Sort of the real nuts and bolts of molecular biology. Yeah. And of course, the group at Duke is interested in uh, kind of taking those insights from basic science and turning them into, you know, effective translational uh, uh, strategies for smoking cessation. And as you may know, um, even to this day, probably the single best um, smoking cessation therapy involves uh, one or another form of what's called nicotine replacement therapy. So something like the nicotine patch, right? Yeah. In fact, uh, my very good friend at Duke is a co-inventor uh, of the of the nicotine patch. Wow. So that's how he kind of made his claim to fame and quite a bit of money until the patent on it expired about a decade ago. Um, but if you uh, ask, well, what, how successful are the nicotine replacement therapies, the PACs, and the PACs is kind of the gold standard. Uh, and success is defined here in terms of six months of abstinence from smoking after you've gone through a, a, a regime of nicotine replacement. So that might be two or three weeks wearing the patch coupled with some other things. Okay. And at best, at best, you get to 40% success. Mm -hmm. Of course, once you go beyond six months, it really drops off quite a bit, yeah. right? So you can combine nicotine replacement therapy with a couple of other pharmacotherapy approaches. And one of the more popular ones is something called bupropion, Okay which is in bupropion, I don't know how much basic neurobiology you know, but bupropion is a kind of a totally uptake. It basically, uh, its major effect is to block the reuptake of norepinephrine, serotonin, dopamine, et cetera. Yeah. And so if you add uh, bupropion to the mix, you can get up maybe to 45%, 50%, hmm. something like that. Yeah. Uh, so the more that you pile on, uh, you never get add you never get strictly additive effects. You always get kind of sub-additive effects. And once you get beyond two of these kinds of treatments, you also have to start worrying about drug-drug interactions, and that becomes complicated. But I would say that the standard, that the best treatment package that we have now for smoking cessation is a combination of nicotine replacement therapy and bupropion. And that will probably get you, in good hands, that will get you to maybe 50% abstinence uh, and cessation, uh, defined as not smoking a cigarette or not relapsing, uh, as long as six months after the, um, yeah. after the cessation. So, so I was so that's the best, right? And mm -hmm. in fact, a couple of years ago, uh, when the study I'm going to tell you about was done, uh, it was really that combination hadn't even been come up with. It was really just nicotine replacement therapy by itself, and that was getting people to 33, 40 percent, et cetera. So I was really, and all of those therapies are target. They're what are called receptor target therapies, all right? So nicotine acts on the so-called neuronal nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, mm -hmm. propion acts on the uh, reuptake inhibitors, et cetera. So all of those strategies are sort of at the very early initial stages of neural information processing, right? Mm -hmm. So I was quite struck by the report from the Johns Hopkins group, all right? And I think the, the lead researcher on this, I think his name is Matt Johnson. Um, when he reported uh, in a, uh, this was granted, it was a very, very small trial. It wasn't really a control group, okay? I think there were only 20 subjects, okay? Which by clinical standards is, is really small. And of course, uh, you know, it wasn't a randomized clinical trial and people knew what they were taking, et cetera, et cetera. But the amazing thing was, is that he reported, and that was a, that's a very solid group. I mean, these are not like oddballs off in some, uh, you know, out of the way place, uh, you know, kind of working by themselves. This is a very well-funded group, a collective group at uh, in the medical school there, Johns Hopkins Medical School. 
And um, a lot of the, the people there that are associated with that group are tremendously well-respected pharmacologists, right? So anyways, a couple of years ago, I think the original publication was in 2006, and then there has since been one follow-up. But what Johnson originally reported is that for these 20 individuals, a single dose, a single dose of psilocybin, all right, was capable of producing something like 60% uh, wow. abstinence. And if they got three doses, okay, so the way they worked it is if you didn't really have much of an effect the, after the single dose, then they gave you a second one, mm -hmm. and then you got a third one, et cetera. And I can forward you the reference if you want to check. Um, they got up to 80% and really just completely unheard of in terms of effectiveness of smoking cessation. And it's uh, really interesting as to the explanation that some of these people gave for why the psilocybin experience yeah. was in allowing them to finally quit the habit of smoking. And by the way, you got to understand that the people that get uh, that enter these kinds of trials, that these are people. So smoking, as it turns out, is the hardest addiction to stop. All right, yeah. even more so than opiates or amphetamine or cocaine or anything else. Even though smoking doesn't have any of the uh, euphoria, uh, nowhere's near the euphoria associated with it, the, uh, the classic drug that boosts it. Uh, but it's, but nevertheless, it's hard to stop. And the, the person, the, the average number of attempts that successful stop smokers make before they finally are able to do it is on the order of nine or ten. So they, they are trying a very, very large number of times. And so these people that you know came into the trial were people who had, had kind of been through the mill in terms of trying to stop smoking. Mm -hmm. So 16 of 20 people were able to stop. Some of the insights that the individuals had, uh, they said things like, when I was in the, you know, when I was having the psilocybin experience, you know, I was just marveling at and reflecting on how beautiful the world was and how much there was, how much there was. How, how many great things there were to see and, you know, just, uh, you know, I, they were kind of in awe of the, of all of the potential wonderful experiences they could have. So, and they kind of came to a realization. It was a top down realization. Why would I want to cut my nose if I continue to smoke? You know, it was uh, kind of, and, and that's a, a very interesting approach to treating addiction. Uh, so it's this kind of top-down rewiring of neural systems and uh, neural networks. And exactly how these drugs are doing that, nobody really knows. <laughs> I mean, we sort of know, you probably, if you've been uh, you know, reading up on this, you probably know that what uh, the classic psychedelics all have in common these are the ones that act on the, uh, the serotonin 2A receptor. Uh, so these would be the, uh, you know, the, uh, the indole, apple, apple, amines, LSD, psilocin, and the, uh, et cetera. And yeah. then the phenylethylamine type one. So mescaline and a couple of others. And what they all seem to have in common is they cause uh, a deactivation of what's called the default mode network in the brain. And the thing is that this default mode network comes about as close as, uh, as you know, we can really understand at the moment to sort of being the instantiation of the ego, if you will. Okay. Yeah. And so this, this dissolution of the ego that is associated with deactivation of the DMM, the default mode network, and the uh, and taking that thing online, the DMM, the default mode network, is a lot like a, you know, a good analogy here would be a conductor or a master regulator. Okay, and so when that network goes silent or becomes quiet, other networks within the brain feel to talk enough. They normally they they normally don't. 
So for example, you may have visual visual processing networks talking to and communicating with auditory networks. And so that's how you mm. might have the experience of quote, seeing music, hearing colors, et cetera, et cetera, because these networks that normally are sort of segregated from one another and don't really directly talk to one another are able to do so once uh, under the influence of the classic psychedelics when the default mode network is being activated. Well, so that's really interesting. So you're saying during the psychedelic experience, people are able to actually, um, well, connect different parts of their brains is one of those parts, you know, psychedelics are very, very highly correlated with religious experience. Yes, yes, yes. Right. And by the way, so Mm -hmm. the thinking is uh, that psychedelics are just a quick and dirty route to doing what religious experience, meditation, other sorts of practices that cultures have learned about for hundreds, if not thousands of years, they, you know, the, the, the psychedelics are a quick and dirty route to doing that. Okay? Mm. But they're fundamentally doing and making use of some of the same mechanisms that uh, meditation, chanting, religious, other sorts of religious practices uh, do as well. And there actually is a very active area of uh, a group of people that are actively pursuing. Uh, pursuing That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Be- because there's a there was a great quote that I heard from, um, I think it was Dr. Jordan Peterson. He's a Canadian. Yeah. Yeah. And he said something like, um, when, when suggesting, you know, should people take psychedelics, especially recreationally, he gave the... He gave the advice, don't use wisdom that you didn't earn because, well, because, well, there, there's a lot of wisdom that comes into this, but part of, part of the gaining the wisdom is the seeking of the wisdom itself. So one thing, one question that I do have for you is you have that same mindset or do you think that uh, psilocybin recreational um, use of psychedelics should be used a little bit more widely? So, so first of all, let me distinguish between kind of two uh, categories of use of psychedelics, right? Mm-hmm. There is what I'm going to refer to as the medical use of psychedelics for treating depression, addictions, psychological problems of all sorts, okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, obsessive, cult, obsessive compulsive disorder, et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, I think for medical uses... Um, especially somebody who is suffering from major depression or, uh, you know, or is addicted to nicotine, et cetera. Mm-hmm. I don't know how successful uh, some of the more benign or uh, less dramatic uh, religious practices, meditation are really going to be. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I mean, I think there's a reason why, You know, MDMA and ketamine are basically uh, uh, in the process of getting FDA approval for treatment of PTSD and major depressive depression because they work when other things don't. Okay, they're 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 kind of like yeah. I I mean this. I don't want to uh, emphasize this too much because it sounds a little pejorative, but they are in some sense at least compared to something like mindful medi- mindfulness and meditation and yoga and all these other kinds of practices, they are kind of like chemical sledgehammers. And they will do in eight hours what it would probably take a, uh, you know, an experienced meditator eight to 10 years to be able to do. Yeah. So in terms of producing a, giving, in terms of giving you a glimpse of what it's like to be free from these incapacitating and really debilitating psychological problems. I, I think they, I think they have a tremendous, tremendous potential. You know? mm-hmm. It's still early days, but boy, I am, I, I gotta say, I'm really impressed. So that's one area. Okay. Now the other area, which I think is equally interesting and equally legitimate has to do with the use of, you know, the, the classic kind of use of psychedelics for uh, expanding consciousness uh, broadening your outlook on the world and life, even when you don't suffer from any psychological issue. So yeah. being better than good kind of thing. Okay. Uh, and I think that, you know, the majority of people that experiment with psychedelics, particularly as young adults or teenagers, et cetera, are really doing it 
for that latter reason. I mean, there may be some people that are trying to medicate themselves for a psychological problem, but as you know, uh, you know, teenager and young adulthood is a time of exploration, intense curiosity. You want to know what's possible, et cetera. You want to experience the world and all of its blooming uh, buzz and glory, et cetera. And I think, uh, I think there, psychedelics, uh, again, can uh, be like opening a window on another world or another dimension, and they can do it really uh, quickly. Now, I would agree with Peterson in that, you know, the, it, with one of the things we know about psychedelics is that set and setting, as it's often referred to, or context is everything. Where yeah. you take it, with who, what kinds of people you have to help okay. guide you through it if you're taking it for the first time, et cetera, yeah. makes all the difference in the world. And, you know, that's not very well controlled. Obviously, the other tremendous thing uh, to be concerned about in terms of, again, for lack of a better term, let's call it recreational use of psychedelics, is uh, you don't know what you're getting. You know, if you're taking it at a, a music festival or a rave or something yeah. like that. You really have no idea what you're getting, really, for sure, unless it's coming from somebody who you really know and trust. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, there are a lot of bad actors out there. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if, um, so I go to a lot of these music festivals, and there's a group, I can't remember what their name is, but they basically, um, you know, set up, a, set up testing stations, all right, mm-hmm. uh, where you can bring your drugs by and they will... Uh, run it through an HPLC and some other chemical analytical tests, and they'll tell you what's in it. And uh, you know, and the and the uh, the whole point of that is basically to save lives and prevent yeah. and That's that's a tremendous service, I think. So, you know, going the right using it recreationally. Uh, I mean, it's you know, it's it's a little bit of Russian roulette. Um, yeah. but I do think it has its place, especially. If you can take it with people that are experienced and can kind of guide you through it, they mm. know what to do in the event that you begin to have a bad experience, et cetera. Yeah. And also you just use kind of good, uh, you know, uh, normal health practices. So you're not staying up all night, you're staying hydrated uh, and all the rest of it, you know. Yeah. So that, that's what it seems like to me. So from what you're saying is it sounds like psychedelics sort of rewire the brain and sure it pulls you out of the, out of your daily experience. But what it sounds like is since it's yep. doing that, it could go positive or it could go negative because one of the main yes. we'll say critiques of psychedelics, and this might be dogmatic, but this also might be legitimate is that there, there are stories, anecdotal stories of people getting, let's say lost, right. In terms of, yeah. They take a psychedelic experience and their brain rewires and it rewires in, let's say, a negative way. You know, they develop some form of PTSD, you know, they become hyper anxious, things like that. You know, you have the the entire critique of the hippie movement right in the 1960s is that's exactly what they were like. They would take psychedelics for so long that they became so lost and so disconnected from reality. So I want some of that uh, is, I think, propaganda because. uh, So, by the way, have you read uh, Michael Pollan's book, How to Change Your Mind? No, micro. You ought to begin. You should begin there. Okay, if you want a great, very readable uh, introduction to the history of the use of psychedelics, both past and present. Okay, and uh, a very updated and accurate, uh, easy to understand description of the science. All right, mm-hmm. uh, it's Michael Pollan's book. Uh, he's he's written a whole. I think it won a. Uh, it was a New York Times book of the year or two years ago, three years wow. ago. Like very, very good. And he's a terrific writer, by the way. Um, very entertaining. You, you may, know, may know or be aware of a couple of his other books. One of them is called The Omnivore's Dilemma. He's very interested in plants and the life of plants. But that's a terrific book. Uh, on Amazon very inexpensively you can also get it as an audible uh as a uh, you know a, um what do you call it a book on you know uh, download it and like on yeah. it or something and in fact the version that's being sold right now is one he does the reading okay and he's a he's a very very good good reader mm-hmm. so um 
If you go to YouTube and you just um, type in a search, Michael Pollan, P-O-L-L-A-N, psychedelics, you'll get like 50 videos of him. And these are not like the Joe Rogan kind of things. I mean, <laughs> these are these are presentations in, usually in front of academic audiences, World Science Festival, et cetera. And he's a very sober, uh, you know. Uh, Reasonable. Slight, anyways, to, to kind of move back to the point that you were making, he talks about how, you know, the whole history, Albert Hoffman's discovery of LSD when he was working for Sandoz Laboratories in Switzerland. Originally back in 1938, he kind of put it on the shelf and then came back to it, I think in 1943, about five years later. And of course, the, the story is that he accidentally got some on his fingertips and got a little bit, uh, hmm. you know, adjusted a little bit. Yeah. And 30 minutes later, realized, whoa, this was something really unusual. And, um, and in fact, in commemoration of that event, so he, he had a lab assistant, he had, a, he had his lab assistant help him get home. Um, and they rode bicycles through the streets. So throughout Europe, this is celebrated every year as Bicycle Day. It's kind of equivalent. It's kind of equivalent to 420 here in the United States, right? That's funny. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's really great. Um, but uh, Sandoz, uh, uh, which was the uh, <clears throat> the chemical company, realized that you know they had something potentially really interesting here on their hands. And yeah. so for about 10 or 15 years, Sandoz uh, kind of conducted a, um, uh, uh, they basically provided free uh, pharmaceutical grade pure LSD to any legitimate scientific researcher who wanted to test its effects. And mm -hmm. so there was a period of about 15 or 20 years where uh Sandoz was basically kind of uh, funding throughout the world these trials uh, yeah. uh, of people, and you know, the, and things were looking really good. And then the '60s came, and the counterculture got hold of it, and uh, one can, I think, quite legitimately point the finger at Timothy Leary, who. Uh, so what happened essentially, as Pollen describes it. The drugs got out of the laboratory and out into the culture at large. And you had people like Timothy Leary tune in, turn on, drop out, et cetera. Yeah. And that was very, very threatening to uh, the political establishment. Nixon, in particular, viewed uh, LSD. And, and so Nixon was afraid, and I think his fears were quite justified, that if you kind of had this uh, epiphany about what the world you know, what was really worthwhile in terms of how you should be spending your time and everything else, mm -hmm. that uh, young American boys would not become cannon fodder, would not go off to fight the wars. And yes. so, uh, you know, for really political reasons, uh, the drugs got put on, the, the LSD and similar drugs got put on to the, uh, into the DEA scheduling category, uh, Schedule 1, and they were outlawed, and then you know the FBI, the CIA, et cetera, began to uh, began to go after uh, psychedelic users very, very heavily. And of course, uh, Leary was kind of hounded and jailed several times. So. Yeah, and I'm assuming there was a lot of propaganda that came from it. Right? Quite a bit, yeah. So, so uh, the the Johns Hopkins group. Is a, is a terrific group. And another uh, big name that I think you should look for, uh, and again, I'm a big fan of YouTube because especially if you pick the right YouTube video, you can get in 30 or 45 minutes a terrific overview. It's kind of like, you know, it's like Wikipedia, right? Mm -hmm. Give you a kind of an, an overall global introduction to some of these areas. So uh, another couple of... Um, one name in particular that you should definitely check out is the name Roland Griffiths, R-O-L-A-N-D-G-R-I-F-F-I-T-H-S, Roland Griffiths. And I think he's in his 70s. Again, he's a psychopharmacologist at uh, Johns Hopkins University. He's uh, tremendously uh, 
one, you know, tremendously well respected in the field, and et cetera. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, uh, where was I going with this? Uh, um, he, he, uh, dogma. Um... Yeah. So he's he, he he is kind of one of the leaders of this group at, at Johns Hopkins, and um, they, they are very careful uh, when they accept somebody into one of their studies. They are very, very careful to screen for kind of pre-existing psychological vulnerabilities yeah. that make that person uh, at risk uh, for a bad trip or for flashbacks and everything else. And so, uh, you know, they, they go out of their way to prevent people who might really be harmed by the experience from, uh, from getting into these trials and having them. And uh, again, to the whole rewiring thing, there's one kind of thing that's really interesting here that's worthwhile mentioning. And this really comes out in the clinical, uh, the clinical trial studies where people are taking it, uh, using the drug to treat depression, OCD, what have you, et cetera. Um, so when they are under the influence of LSD, and LSD or psilocin, it's mostly psilocin at this point, because LSD is not so yeah, available. So it's psilocin, psilocybin, et cetera. Uh, when they're actually, the half-life of those probably on the order of several hours, okay? So after six, eight hours or something, you have peed most of it out, okay? And you no longer have the drug in your system, and it's no longer interacting with receptors. Although, in the case of the classical psychedelics, there's an interesting mechanism where if you consider this to be a, uh, a, a, a neurotransmitter receptor, here's the serotonin 5-HT2A receptor. Mm-hmm. And this might be the place where psilocin sits down in the receptor. Mm-hmm. Unlike the other drugs that act on that receptor, so the natural one, of course, would be serotonin, uh, the way in which the drug interacts with the receptor is it kind of pulls the trap door shut on itself. So it actually remains engaged with the receptor longer than you might think, okay? Uh, and certainly longer than the endogenous neurotransmitters, again, like serotonin or, or phenylethylamine. Yeah. But in any event, after, you know, for in, in most cases, probably after 6, 10 hours, something like that, the drug is pretty much gone. It's no longer in your system. Now, while, uh, while you're under the influence of the drug, that's when you have the hallucinations and the florid sensory experiences, particularly the visual hallucinations, etc. That's also when you uh, sometimes have the, for lack of a better term, these uh, you know uh, deep emotional experiences. Okay, yeah. which can be either good or bad, depends on the experience. And the uh, but it doesn't end there. And so it's, what seems to happen and the rewiring that happens seems to happen during the subsequent debriefing. So you ha- you take the drug, you have this kind of wild experience, and then it's thinking about the experience and integrating it into your into your own you know personal autobiographical history. Yeah, and that basically occurs during the subsequent days. That's when the real change seems to occur. Okay? Mm, interesting. So it's it, again, it's like the drug uh, enables it, it. It engenders, and the the receptors that these drugs act on, the five HT two A receptors, are are well known for underlying a whole slew of brain plasticity mechanisms. Mm. So it, it's probably the case these psychedelics are enabling and taking advantage of these intrinsic endogenous brain plasticity mechanisms uh, that can allow for these, uh, you know, dramatic rewiring effects and top down, uh, you know, re of your uh, entire view. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things that I found most interesting because what people say it's a life changing experience, right? Like people are able to change their lives. And if we're going to get back to it, right. With nicotine, 80% of people are able to ditch the thing that has been 
pulling them down for years, if not decades. And well, you asked the question, right? How widespread could this, could this experience be? You know, like, does it work for nicotine as well as depression, as well as, you know, I didn't, people as, I didn't hear what, I didn't hear what you said there. You cut out for about 30 seconds. So oh, I'm I, sorry. I yeah. So, so do you think that, um, do you think that something like these brain changing experiences, especially if you apply them to the 80% success rates in, um, in the nicotine studies, do you think they could be applied to essentially all measures, right? All, you know, little habits. Well, that people so the, the, I think the answer is you don't know until you do the study. Okay. All mm -hmm. right. So, uh, and one of the things that, I, you know, I have really, one of, the, one of the big questions I have is why hasn't that 20 person, 80% success rate study been replicated yeah. yeah okay i mean this is a you know this is potentially a uh you know a breakthrough therapy and i do know that matt johnson i think i've got his right matt i know for sure that his last name is johnson but um you, you know what hold on i'm gonna use my phone to uh to check it yeah sure uh, if i could find it yeah. Um, but, you know, so if this were other drug, if this were made by Eli or, you know, any of the other, or Pfizer or any of the big pharma companies that are trying to bring drugs to treat addiction to market, this thing, people would be all over this thing. And yeah. They'd be you know, looking at it. So what, uh, let's see, my understanding, the last time I looked at it, and there's a very, very nice review that I can send you, okay, from maybe two years or so ago. Yeah, his name is Matthew Johnson. Let's see, can you see that? Yeah, I see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Young guy. Matthew Johnson, psychedelics. Yeah. So... Yeah, professor of psychiatry, et cetera, working with psychedelics since 2004, et cetera, et cetera. Anyways, uh, he's another one. If you, if you type his name into Google, you'll get videos of him giving, you know, quite, quite sober talks about that work. Uh, but my understanding is really there's, there was that initial pilot study, and then there was another uh, larger uh follow-up study that is in process or it may be in the getting written up now. And I think that they've had, you know, similar success rates in both, both cases. But um, so far, I don't know that it, this work has been independently replicated by any other group. All right. Yeah. And of course, part of the problem is being able to get a license to work with psychedelics. I mean, so they're tremendous. It's tremendously regulated. It's very, very hard to, hard to, uh, uh, to uh, you know, be able to uh, be able to do get these drug delivery to be able to use them in these supervised clinical settings. Yeah. Uh, but in any event, if I remember correctly, people have had uh, similar sorts of success. Or they also look promising for ethanol for alcoholism. All right, and in fact. Um, the original founder of the 12 steps program. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can't remember the guy's name, but he himself had experience with psychedelics and yeah. he had a positive experience with it. And he was originally thinking of uh, trying to incorporate it into the 12 steps program. He ultimately didn't because of the, uh, I think the, uh, the bad politics that was associated hmm. with it. Yeah. But um you know, I think there's a there's there's certainly reason to be cautiously optimistic that these psychedelic drugs are going to be effective for a whole range of substances that are typically abused. So you won't know until the data is in, but they, they are looking pretty good at this point, is what is the way I would put it. Certainly worth uh, a really sober, uh, careful look. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that I think people find the most fascinating. You know, when you think about it, psychedelics are 
extremely different than almost any other drug, right? Because maybe they're similar in, in a degree to marijuana, but they don't really release that much dopamine as in they're not that much, they're not very addicting. And instead of, they're not, they're not, they're not, like conventional, uh, you know, abuse, etc. Yeah. Uh, and for many of these drugs, uh, so there's a pharmacology lethal dose 50 okay mm -hmm. and what ld50 refers to is how much of a drug do you have to give to a laboratory rat or animal to kill it okay mm -hmm. and as you probably know delta 9 thc has no ld50 all right you can't give enough to an animal and the same is true apparently for a little less true for some of the psychedelics because the ser ser these things are all interacting with the serotonin system. Serotonin regulates blood pressure, right? Mm. Uh, and so you can probably send somebody's blood pressure through the roof mm. or, or actually it's the reverse as it turns out, okay? Uh, mm. you lower blood pressure to the point where they kind of pass out or faint. Um, but... Uh, you know, the actual physical danger that's posed by these drugs, if they're pure and they don't have some contaminant in them, okay, is is really pretty minimal. You know? Yeah. Like that, I'm that, sorry I interrupted you. No, it's you fine. Know. You're actually, you're just expanding my point. I love it. So, you know, that's, that's, huh? that's a great part about it, right? They're very, they're very non-addictive. At the same time, they're very... I know there's a lot of outliers, but it's not one of the constant use type of drugs. You know, it's not like nicotine where you have to smoke every second alcohol where you have to drink every night. Psychedelics are more of a, they're more of a one-time experience that you have once in a while, you know, rituals, things of that sort. Absolutely. Absolutely. They're, when they're used, they're used very infrequently. Uh, oftentimes in the context of, you know, rituals, of some sort, okay, mm -hmm. uh, and um, you know the you don't binge on them, uh, yeah. right? In the way that you uh, you know uh, typical college drinking pattern, mm -hmm. drink, okay. Well, that's you use them, and then you kind of process and recover, you know, during the next couple of months, and then maybe you might or you might not take them again, it kind of depends. yeah. Exactly. Right. It seems really interesting that, you know, you do it right. The whole purpose is not to is not to actually dull your brain. Right. It's not to like alcohol. Alcohol numbs the brain and it makes it shuts down your prefrontal cortex. You stop thinking. Right. And that's the most commonly used drug. Nicotine has no effects on pulling you out of the experience. It also has some, something like a numbing effect. But you look at something like psychedelics and they actually have the effect of opening you up instead of shutting you down. And I find that's the most interesting part about it, because, again, right, the whole purpose is not to take it every single day and rewire your brain every single day. It's more of a it's more of a once in a while pitching you out of your daily experience, pitching you out of what you call the default mode network and well, pulling you into something that's that that allows you to reframe your experience. And I think that th there's a lot of promise in that. That's a good way of putting it. So that uh, a lot of people talk about the analogy that many people use in talking about psychedelics is that it's reset button. It's like yeah. the reboot button uh, for the brain as a whole. Yeah. And I find that that part seems pretty incredible. It pitches you out and, um, and yeah, I mean, one of the things that I find the most interesting is the neuroplasticity of it in general. So uh, have you read any studies or have you done any studies in terms of how the real magnitude that it actually has in changing not only someone's brain structure and neuroplasticity, but their genetic structure to the gene level? Uh, as far as I know, there's no mechanism that uh, has been identified mm -hmm. that would allow for psychedelics to alter DNA. So that was part of the propaganda, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, that, you know, kind of got unleashed back in the 60s. The idea was that, you know, your children might be born with four, four arms or something mm -hmm. like that if you took enough psychedelics and that kind of thing. Total myth, no basis in science for that at all. Uh, those drugs don't 
they're not like uh, CRISPR. They don't rewrite, uh, you know, DNA or induce mutations or anything like that. Now, there might be contaminants in street versions of some of these drugs that have those effects. But uh, the pure drugs themselves don't do that. I mean, they're very, very, uh, uh, and we, we think we know what their major molecular binding site is within the brain. And it's the so-called 5-HT2A receptor, either by itself or as a hetero oligomer with something that's called the uh, metabotropic type 2 receptor, mglur 2 And there may be oligomers of 5-HT2A and mglur 2 and it's that special unique oligomer that might be uh, targeting, in addition to 5-HT2A receptor. Yeah, well, serotonin is so... Yeah, so don't don't have to worry about your DNA uh, being mutated or being rewritten or anything like that. Okay, interesting. Would do you think there are any other? You know, obviously, a lot of the things that I've heard about psychedelics are very um, are very just you know things that people know very dogmatic. Do you have any other things that you believe sure. are the misconceptions yeah. that people have in general about psychedelics? Um, do you? Again, I would really direct you to Pollen, okay, because he, uh, he, he does a great job of debunking many of the myths of the classic, uh, classic psychedelics, okay? Okay. Um, so, yeah, the idea that, um, you know, you, can all, that you basically can change DNA the, it is certainly a myth. The idea that uh, a high percentage of people, normal people who use psychedelics may experience uh, flashbacks and may, as a result, uh, have such a bad experience that they throw themselves out of a window, for example, okay, yeah. and commit suicide, okay? Yeah. Most of that is myth, too, okay? Now, there, there, there may actually be... Uh, a couple of cases where that happened, but it seems to have happened uh, as a result of an unauthorized and quite illegal CIA mind control experiment. So they were basically uh, dosing with LSD without their permission or knowledge. And they happened to be CIA employees, <laughs> you know. Hmm. And I think probably the, the one case that it probably has the, the, the greatest degree of documentation behind it, I think most people accept, is exactly that kind of case. CIA, I mean, like CIA was interested in the kinds of, you know, black ops kinds of things that they're always interested in. Yeah. You know, how can you control political leaders in other countries? Could you basically use it as a truth serum kind of stuff? And basically none of that seems to be true, by the way, okay? Yeah. You can't get somebody to act in a way that they wouldn't normally act by giving them a, a hefty dose of LSD, for example. That's another uh, myth. Okay. Um, but uh, again, the possibility of a bad experience is a real one with these drugs, especially if you uh, fall into certain psychiatric categories. So there are these people who... Like if you have a, so for example, if you if you have a family history of psychosis or schizophrenia, mm -hmm. these do not be concave, okay? Hmm. Uh, and potentially uh, very bad things to do. But yeah. even quite normal individuals, and Pollen describes as part of the background for this book that he wrote, he actually, you know, took, I can't remember if it was psilocin or if he took uh, uh, this thing called smoking, the t there's a compound the DMT-like compound, 5-methoxy DMT, okay. is this thing that's found in the uh, uh, the skin of the Sonoran Desert toad, right? And uh, so he, anyways, he, uh, he he found a shaman, somebody who was willing to give it to him, et cetera. So he took it and he had this experience. And he had uh, what he, at least while he was having, he felt it was a pretty negative and fearful experience. Yeah. But, 
the person mm-hmm. there kind of talked him through it and said, well, you know, go with that. You're fine. You're not going to die, et cetera, you know, and all the rest of it. And so there are people who definitely, who are otherwise quite psychologically healthy, who can have neg- negative experience. And they, this is where I think set and setting makes all the difference, right? Yeah. If you're in an unfamiliar yeah. setting where, you know, you might be a little worried about what, what's going to happen to you if you, you know, uh, have this, you, you go out of your head for a couple of hours. Um, that could be a very anxiety and fear provoking, but he basically describes how the shaman or whoever it was that uh, was kind of supervising his experience kind of guided him through it. And uh, he realized after he was through it that, uh, yeah, it was kind of unpleasant going through it, but it was nevertheless very, very beneficial. And he had some, you know, in what he felt were uh, incisive insights into his own psychology and his, and his personal history. So and those can be good, you know? No. Yeah. So I was reading this study a while ago. It was actually done by Johns Hopkins University yeah. in psychedelics. And what they did was, so they had this shamanistic type person where they would have people come in and take psychedelics and they made sure that, um, that, a few days before the psychedelic trip that the person would go on, they would meet the doctor, meet the shaman. Right. And, um, and start to gain their trust. And the shaman was trained in a very, um, in very, manner like that, where if you're going through a negative experience, then you sort of guide them through the negative experience, try to frame right. the negative experience in a positive light and, um, and do it. And what they said was, and, yeah, and, they're, and they're given a lot of reassurance. They're told, yeah. look, if anything should happen, we have a doctor in the other room and they can administer appropriate medical help and all the rest of it. So, yeah, you know, exactly. you, you, know, so, you don't need to worry. Uh, you're not going to dodge the fear that many have because, the ego kind of dissolves. Many people uh, are fearful that they literally are going to die physically, mm-hmm. right? Uh, uh, you know, they don't. Well, it's it's interesting. So they had they they put in their study. I'm not sure if it was either 40 percent or 60 percent. I think it was 60 percent. They said 60 percent of people had uh, within the entire experience had a negative experience within the entire experience, and. Part of that is the typical story. That seems high. By the way, that seems like a very high number to me. But we mm-hmm. should check that. Interesting. No, I will. But I, and I'll definitely put it in the um, in the description. But right. one of the things that I found was really interesting was all of those people. So throughout the entire study, zero percent of the people framed the entire experience as negative. Yes. Even though they had a negative experience within it, and a lot of what people talk about is a feeling of letting go, right? Because the the big thing about letting go of your ego, let's say, or letting go of your default mode, is that there's a reason why that default mode is up, right? The default mode gives you structure. The default mode gives you an, an ability to hold on to something, even though you know we could call psychedelics a liberator. Maybe some people don't want to be liberated, right? Or there's That's some- right. I mean, I think we do tend to be very tied to this narrative conception of ourselves. So I'm a professor. I've been, you know, and a grandfather and a parent and I have Mm -hmm. done this and that and all the rest of it. You're a little earlier in the journey, but you, I'm sure, have a kind of category capsule summary of yourself. You kind of carry around and. And the default mode network in your brain is it it seems to be playing a critical role in maintaining that sense of personal identity and ego. Yeah. And so if you are really, you know, wedded to that conception of yourself, it can, one can understand why it would be threatening and potentially anxiety provoking to sort of let it go. You might, you might mistakenly identify that with, Oh, I'm going to get so high. I'm going to, I think you referred to it earlier. I'm going to get so lost that I'll never be able to get back to yeah. my original self. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a that's a fear and an anxiety. I think very few people actually ever experience that. Well, it's re- it's really interesting because what you're talking about is sort of a uh, well. I could see how they connect it to religious experience because what you just described is a is a Buddhist doctrine, right? Yes. Buddhist doctrine is that we create these categories, right? And all these categories, I call myself a podcast host and an author and a student and all these things, right. but in reality, I'm really just fitting myself into a box and 
I have so many different personalities that are always interacting with each other. So like, for example, if I go right, if I go out right now and I play with my brother, right. And uh, let's say I play with a four-year-old child, right. We go and I babysit and we do some sort of something like that. Then I will start acting more like a child, right. I'll be playing, I'll be having fun. I'll be, I'll be laughing more. I actually had this experience when I go and, uh, play with my parents and my uncles and all these things. They're respectable, civil adults that are 50 years old, but there's that little child part within them. Right. And. Well, and, and so for example, there is a, uh, there's a uh, very well-known and highly regarded developmental psychologist, cognitive scientist at UC Berkeley, Alison Gopnik, G O P N I K. Her brother, uh, is I think Adam Goffman. He writes for the New Yorker. He's a, he's a highly regarded, uh, a highly regarded author. But uh, Goffman has been Allison Goffman, the developmental psychologist, has been very interested in how the mind of a child differs from the mind of an adult, right? Mm. And she really sees parallels between uh, childhood. Uh, you know, the mind of a child, for lack of a better term, and the state that is induced by psychedelics in the sense that, hmm. you know, kids are able to, and usually you see this when they are playing. So kids have imaginary friends all the time, right? Mm-hmm. Kids make up, you know, fantastic mm-hmm. stories about the way the world works, and they come up with all sorts of creative uh, uh, explanations for things. And, um, she basically sees that as kind of really critical for normal intellectual development in human beings. But by the time you get into your, let's say, late teens, early adulthood, our society is one that kind of forces you. You basically got to start churning out the deliver- deliverables. You got to account for yourself, your time, you, you know, the emphasis, particularly in a capital, in the capitalist cultures is on productivity and making a buck and justifying yourself and all the rest of it. It's kind of the antithesis of the unstructured exploration period that you're able to, uh, that we all go through as children, right? She sees psychedelics as basically a return to that very similar kind of uh, unstructured exploration of multiple possibilities uh, in adults, uh, that they would have experienced as children. Hmm. So there's a, there's actually potentially a real interesting connection. And that would really, that, that actually really gelled for me. So there's this, there's this idea of ambiguous figures that exist in, yeah, sure. in the psychological literature, right? So there's a, there's a picture, right. That you see, and you can look at it from two directions. It could either be a rabbit or a duck. And some people see it as a rabbit and some people see it as a duck, but we don't really care about that. One of the thing that's the most interesting to psychologists is that once you see it as a rabbit and you name it as a rabbit, then you don't very hard to see it as a duck. It's very hard. to see it as a duck, Right. So once you give it a category, then you don't. Right. So one of the things right. that I'm assuming you're saying is that, for example, I have these headphones here, right? Once I call them headphones, I, I thought they were earmuffs. I thought they were earmuffs, plastic yeah. earmuffs. Just yeah, right. Like I thought, I thought they could give you warmth, and there are all these different um, right things that go along with it. There was actually a great study that I saw where children they gave adults a staple, right, a physical staple, and they said, "How many uses can you find for this staple?" And uh, adults could get no more than on a dozen, no more than uh, on average, no more than a dozen, right? But children, they found more than a hundred uses for a staple. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, in fact, there are a couple of well-known, there are a couple of really striking visual uh, perception things that are actually now being used in psychedelic research. So um, there is, it's called a rotating mask. So you ever seen the, uh, you know, the mask, the smiling face, and then the sad face, the two faces of arts and draw and uh, of tragedy and comedy. Oh, yes, yes. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. So it turns out that if you take uh, if you take one of these masks, hold on a minute. I'm going to actually do a, uh, uh, 
I'm going to reach for something here that, that may illustrate this. Sure. Better. It just so happens I happen to have a Halloween mask in the uh, in the office. Okay? <laughs> so it turns out. So imagine that this isn't a, a skeleton mask, but imagine it was a mask of a, just a regular human face. Okay? okay. So there's this phenomena that if you start, if you uh, uh, basically rotate it around like this, okay, mm -hmm. people find it very, very difficult uh, to kind of really see it from the reverse side, okay? It mm -hmm. kind of pops out as if it's looking toward, okay? So let's call this concave, convex forward, okay? Mm -hmm. The back would be convex. But as this thing rotates normally, we just have this natural tendency to flip it. So now you're seeing it as convex again, okay? Yeah. Yeah. All right. So it goes from convex to convex. Okay. It's very hard because we never really have the experience of seeing faces from the back. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so it, it turns out that if you, and in fact, this is again on YouTube, I can send you the link to it. Um, uh, if you do this kind of test with people under the influence of psychedelics, okay, they don't have any problem switching it and basically seeing initially what's convex and then what's concave, okay? So again, it's this influence of history, categorical perception, et cetera, being kind of reversed. Yeah. Uh, because our visual system is plastic enough under the influence of psychedelics that we can see things that we normally wouldn't be able to see. Interesting. So it's like, it's like the, the categories themselves, like the things that yes. we normally see are completely broken down. Yes. And uh, so the other thing, and I think I, I don't think I mentioned this, but when I was talking about the default mode network, okay. And how the default mode network goes uh, quiet or becomes deactivated. Okay. Mm -hmm. The end result of that, is that there's a tremendous increase in, for lack of a better term, random activity in the brain, okay? Yeah. And, uh, and so the technical term for this in physics is entropy, disorder, okay? And so initially, if you are just sitting quietly and listening to music or, uh, or thinking, et cetera, you're not engaged in any task, you're not being asked to, you know, call a list of words or anything like that. That default mode network is kind of really keeping things under control. And it's basically regulating the way the salience network, social significance network, the way those networks are are kind of interacting with one another. Mm -hmm. Now, if, you, if the conductor sits down or the master regulator is turned off, and that's the default mode network, those other networks become tremendously active, and what that and so if you were to do a uh, um, a choreogram or a, uh, a a graph of what areas are talking to one another within the brain, you, you see this tremendous increase in the interconnectedness of many areas of the brain that normally aren't talking to one another, and so mm. that's the increase in entropy that occurs under the influence of psychedelics and is thought to be responsible for things like uh, the visit, you know, the hallucinations, et cetera, et cetera. But it's probably also the thing that allows for these insights to emerge yeah, yeah, that's what I was that saying. otherwise are being kind of kept, uh, you know, kept in their own little boxes. So, yeah. Well, that's, that's yeah. one of the things that I notice in my own life, you know, yeah. well, First of all, there's a lot of research that shows that happiness as well as flow experiences, I'm sure you know what flow is, flow experiences yep. are actually a result of a decrease in brain activity, not an increase. And that, that really, right. 
right? Like that really blew my mind. Cause I used to think, all right, if I'm happy, then that means all these parts of my brains are lighting up and blah, blah, blah. This is going to be so great. But uh, really what's, happening, what's really happening is that the parts that. And, and in fact, that was the, the, the original. Uh, so there was a group at uh, university college, London, the guy that leads this uh, and probably one of the more insightful people in the field is this guy named Robin Carhart Harris. And if you start reading in this area, you'll, you'll come up with him. You'll come up with his name right away. So he was the first guy to actually take, he was part of a group. He was in Middleton to individuals, normal, healthy individuals, and put them in an MRI scanner and ask what happens in the brain. People are on psychedelic, particularly in the acute phase when they might be hallucinating. And his, as he describes it, his expectation, as well as everybody else's at the time, was, well, you know, you crazy patient means that, you know, the brain's going to distract him all the time, right? Yeah. And that's all. He saw a decrease in activity, particularly in this thing called the, uh, the uh, default mode network. And... Uh, this kind of just increasing randomness, a lot of activity, but it was random. Um, and, you know, some of the colleagues have come up with good ways of quantifying it. And, uh, you know, I think it's believable. Uh, yeah. That kind of underscores your point that all these experiences are really associated with decreases in activity, not necessarily well, that's the thing that I find the most interesting because, well, what I notice is, and this is something that is generally accepted in just common knowledge, is that most of my ideas that I come up with, you know, the connections between ideas, the epiphanies that I come with are not when I'm saying, okay, I'm going to sit down and come up with an idea. Let's do it. Right. It's more of right. when I'm in the shower, when I'm taking a walk, when I'm going through nature, when I'm really not trying to come up with ideas. And it's like, well, clearly there's the so-called a incubation period where, you know, you think about things for a while, you basically gather knowledge, et cetera, mm -hmm. and then you let go, you go do something else. And then the insights, the eureka moments bubble up as if on their own. You know? Yeah, exactly. And it, and it really seems like, you know, and this is what I've noticed with my ideas. I don't specifically come up with ideas. You know, I don't come up with ideas. I really take one idea and another idea and I put them together to make something new. And uh, yeah. yeah, I think there was a quote by now, Steve. By the way, uh, every moment, there are people within this that have an even more radical view of, of where novel ideas come from, uh, particularly mm. under the influence of psychedelics. Have you heard the name Paul Stamets? Yeah. S-T-A-M-T-Z, okay? So, this is one of the world's experts uh, on fungi, and in particular on mushrooms, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, magic mushrooms, psychedelic mushrooms, okay? And, um, you know, I'm not even sure I... Some of his views strike me a little far, pretty far out there, but he believe he really does believe that plants are trying to tell us things, and they're trying to communicate with, and they're doing so via the chemicals that are in fungi, psilocybin, and uh, magic mushroom. And of course, all those things. Love, uh, Low cycling with drugs, all right? Hmm. So, um, you know, the idea of channeling information or channeling ideas from another, whatever you want to call it, source, dimension, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, but mean. he basically sees this as kind of the plant's attempt to, uh, uh, to communicate with other species, particularly with human species. Huh, that's a very spirit. And there is, by the way, this is a mind blowing. Yeah, this is a mind blowing idea. Okay. There's a guy named, uh, so there's a guy named Terrence McKenna. You know, you ever heard of him? The name I've actually heard of him before. Yeah. Uh, but he would, 
Yeah, so the stoned ape hypothesis of, yes. of human uh, brain evolution, okay? And to boil it down, it's a, it's a tremendously interesting idea. Uh, I don't know if it's true or not, okay? But the, that, and so if you look at the history of brain evolution, things were going along really pretty slowly until about 100,000 years ago. And then there was a tremendously rapid expansion of the cerebral cortex, particularly the frontal areas, right? Mm-hmm. And that's when you begin to see like language and human culture taking off, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, Terence McKenna basically came up with the theory, this is maybe 30 or 40 years ago, and it's just Google the stone ape hypothesis of brain development, okay? That uh, basically humans, Neanderthals in particular, where basically they would hunt and they would, you know, follow, you know, deer or whatever, elephants, whatever it was they were tracking over very long distances. And uh, they would occasionally stop and forage for things to eat. And it turns out not all mushrooms uh, are sort of silicon, right? They serve species that are the source of silicon and silicon are what are called sauce uh, species of mushrooms. That's where um, psilocin and psilocybin come from, right? Mm-hmm. So it turns out that those those species of mushrooms tend to grow in piles of animal dump. And so his theory was, you know, you have these groups, small groups of Neanderthals, they might be tracking some large animal for several days, right? And they you know, they noticed that there was some mushrooms and fungus that was growing in the in the piles of animal scat, and they would ingest it. And uh, as a result of ingesting the magic mushrooms and psilocin, that that drove the uh, cortical divide. And it turns out that there is good, uh, uh, pretty good data. Uh, Stamets actually has a couple of patents uh, for this where uh, these some of the compounds that are found in these mushrooms act as nerve growth factors and, in huh. fact, are capable of uh, uh, turning cell division and, dupl- and uh, uh, cell growth, et cetera. And so there's, there's actually a, a, an interest on the part of several people for treating neurodegenerative with some of these compounds that uh, you might be able to reverse some of the dementia or some of these other, you know, tremendously debilitating neurodegenerative diseases with some of these compounds that are, that are in mushrooms. Now mm-hmm. that's getting, uh, you know, I don't think that the evidence for that is nearly as strong as, you know, it is for ketamines used to treat uh, major depression or MDMA's <laughs> uh, ability to treat PTSD, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, it's worth a look, you know, and, yeah. and uh, you know, it's not a, not an entirely crazy idea. Wow. I mean, that, that would be a very interesting story. You know, like there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of stories, you know, for the people who are pro psychedelics who say like Moses, when he, when he saw God in the, in the, um, on the mountain, right. really, he the was burning bush and uh, yeah. Yeah. The typical religious area. I mean, uh, many, yeah, I, I mean, some people have argued that, yeah. Um, hmm. Well, it wouldn't be ingested an LVM, a little brown mushroom. Exactly. Like, it wouldn't be the most surprising thing because you asked the question, right? How do people sum up, come up with the crazy ideas that they do? And a lot of it just comes with the mind just naturally creates the ideas. You know, I actually had a, I had a teacher one time. Uh, he was talking about Dante's... Uh, we, we were reading yeah, Dante's Inferno. At that point, we we're on uh, Paradiso, right? Where he gets uh-huh. paradise. And what happens is Dante sees an eagle on a chariot, and yeah. and he interacts with I think Jesus in the form of a dragon, something like this. Like there are all these crazy things. And then he sent us into breakout rooms, and he goes, "So try to create a story like that." And he gave us like ten minutes. Yeah. And I'm like teacher how are we supposed to create a story like that and he goes you just create it like come up with a come up with a framework and then try to work with it and i told him i go do you really think that's how the brain works right like the brain does not work 
or I don't, or at least I don't think the brain works in that way. You know, it's just a bunch of crazy ideas sort of coming together. Well, uh, so by the way, people have noted this connection too between the psychedelic experience and, you know, for lack of a better term, what I'll call other quite normal psychological states that all of us experience every night, as a matter of fact, okay? Mm. And there are no sense unusual, right? Lucid dreaming, not everybody is capable of that, but REM sleep, okay? Yeah. Uh, and, you know, if you think about the logic of dreams, a lot of times they're they're crazy, all right? You, oh, yeah. you know, the, the, the rules of physics in everyday life are often violated routinely in dreams. Okay, and um, uh, and so many people believe that are uh, activated during the REM sleep period, and then if you're awake during lucid dreaming periods, that those are kind of minor versions of psychedelic states. Hmm. Interesting. I mean, it would make sense because there's a deactivation of specific brain deactivation. We know that there's a widespread release of serotonin uh, throughout mm. the brain. Serotonin is what all of these uh, classic psychedelics are mimicking. Uh, uh, yeah, 5-HT, 2-A. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So, okay, so I have one final question for you, and I sure. think this is probably a great way to sort of bring it back into the, the regular experiences. You know, there's a, there's a giant trend of microdosing, right, where especially yeah. in Silicon Valley where – they apparently they went from cocaine to, to microdosing uh, because because it not only brings efficiency, but it also unleashes creativity. Right. So how do you feel on the stance of microdosing and what research proves essentially? So I don't think there's any research. I don't think that there's any carefully controlled research that demonstrates uh, that microdosing really works. OK, hmm. now that's not to say that it doesn't. It's just hmm. that there isn't any compelling evidence that it does. Okay. Interesting. And um, part, you know, parts of the microdosing story don't make any sense to me. They basically sound like homeopathy. Okay. So, like, if you take a chemical and you infinitely dilute it, okay, mm -hmm. that you basically can have some effect that the drug wouldn't have at higher concentrations. And in the limit, if you literally do an infinite dilution you are left with a, quote, memory of the drug in your body and that can is supposed to confer immunity to the chemical mm. or something like that. This is typically for toxins. So that's the whole field of homeopathy. So microdosing is kind of a similar idea that there, that, you know, there may be very, very small doses of the classic psychedelics that you can take that won't produce the, you know, the classic hallucinations and won't take you offline yeah. Uh, out of the office for, you know, a day or two, uh, but will uh, allow you, you know, there are versions of a smart drug and they will allow you to work and be more creative and come up with new ideas, et cetera, et cetera. And I just don't think that there's any evidence for it. Uh, and furthermore, I don't think that there's a mechanism. Uh, hmm. All right. Yeah. Now, some people swear by it, but people swear by all kinds of things. And, and so I think until you have, uh, you know, really carefully controlled study, double blind, where microdose don't know whether they're getting anything or whether they're just getting, you know, a little bit of uh, aspirin or something like that. And furthermore, so a, a classical double blind randomized control trial, until you, until that kind of evidence is available for microdosing, uh, I'm just, I just don't know. I, you know, I, I, I just don't think the evidence is there. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, you know, one of the, one of the theories that I think people have is not that it completely shuts down everything and sort of it's an on, on, on off switch like this, um, like this default mode network. The thing that I've heard yeah. is more of it is a, let's say, right it's more of a modulator where the default network, default mode network, maybe it's not at a hundred percent, but it's at yeah. 90 right if you if you control the dose properly and then from there you have you have creativity gets to take a step up my response, is, my, response my response to that is interesting idea show me the data show mm -hmm. me somebody that's actually done that study and 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 you know then uh, then i think we have something to talk about but it, but until 
you know, I think you, until you have the careful scientific studies of it, I just, just don't, you know, I think it, uh, you know, people speculate. Yeah. No, I think, I think it's interesting. You know, one of the, it's, it's as if psychedelic research is the closest um, way that humans have been able to sort of conduct scientific research on mystical experiences. I actually, that's why, that's why I find this the most interesting. And I really enjoy how you've been able to take this. Yeah. Al- oh, yeah. Although there are, you know, there are people who have who identify increases in certain components of the power spectra of, and it's only true of ex- really experienced meditation. So people that have been, you know, uh, meditating for something like eight to 10 years. Okay. So the novice meditator is not able to do this, but there's a big, so there's, there's a guy, there's a professor of psychology, university of Wisconsin. that's quite well known for this Mm -hmm. psychology and neuroscience. His name is uh, Ricky Richard uh, Davidson or Davison. Okay. Um, And he's been studying this for probably a decade. And he has a couple of pretty high profile articles that appeared in, you know, really terrific scientific journals, the national proceedings of the National Academy of Science and, you know, really good journals where, uh, again, what he did was EEG studies of normal individuals, novice meditators defined as people who have been doing it for like one or two years and then real experienced people people who have you know been doing it for 10 years and the bottom line i'm probably oversimplifying it and getting a little bit of some of the details wrong but as i recall the kind of the major take-home message here was in experienced meditators like zen buddhist monks and only in the really experienced meditators you see that uh even when they are at rest and when they are not actively meditating, but when they are just sitting quietly at rest, uh, you see a, a very prominent increase in what's called gamma hertz frequency power spectrum. Okay. And that is supposed to be correlated with the release of a whole variety of neuropeptides that are generally beneficial for brain health. Hmm. something called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, management of stress, decreases in cortisol release, norepinephrine, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, to return to, I think, the very, very beginning question that you had, I think you can achieve some of those uh, effects that uh, a lifetime or you know, a decade of meditating and practice and hard work uh, allows you to control. I think you can achieve those maybe for a day or two hmm. with, uh, with a dose of psychedelics. And, uh, but you don't want to be taking psychedelics every day. Uh, and so that I think will give you the glimpse of what's possible and perhaps be the motivation to go about it in the more orthodox way by taking up meditation or some other religious practice. So huh. not religious, but uh, a mindful. Yeah. Well, I think that's a great place to end it. That's, a, that's some great recommendations. And yeah, I hope that, uh, well, I found this very interesting. I'll say that much, you know, this really does do a great job pitching yeah. me out of man. Well, it was great. To be here. I got a couple of errands to run and, uh, uh, I'm heading out of town, but sometime within the next day, I'll shoot you an email and, and, uh, send you, uh, a couple of reading lists, uh, et cetera, and you can start working your way through them if, you, if you're motivated. I will. I definitely will be. So. Okay. All right. Definitely. Have a good one. You too. Take care. Yep.